off our scan for now. So we're just going to do the usual. If you've been here last couple weeks, it's nmap-a-t4 for the speed. We're going to scan all ports, and then we said it was 10.10.10.40. So depending on how many of you guys are actually scanning at the same time, this may cause a little bit of delay. I did a scan earlier, and it took about five minutes. So um, in terms of resources on navigating a machine, uh, really repeat enumeration again, like... Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of it. A lot of what I do, especially when I get access to a machine, it's lower priv. Or even if, say, let's say we get root. Um, you're looking for token impersonation, if that allows you to get domain admin. You're looking for hash dumps. Or if you have Kiwi, you're looking to jump credentials like a W Digest or see if you get Kerberos tickets. There's a lot of things that you can be looking out for. Uh, and we'll we'll cover all that. Any other questions while we wait? How is the quality? I'm getting a notification here that there's some skip frames. I just want to make sure that everything's good because I can tone it down a bit if you guys are uh, getting some skip frames on my end. Okay, good. Yeah, everything looks fine. I don't see anything like drop frames or anything. I just get a notification here. So just want to make sure. So what we're going to be doing tonight is we're going to be covering uh, a couple things. So the first box is going to be blue. And if you have any guesses onto what that is, it's going to be eternal blue. Uh, it's something that we see commonly, I would say, on assessments still, even though it's a pretty older exploit. By older, I mean a couple years, um, which is, I would say, is pretty old for exploit terms, seeing as that there's exploits that come out every day. Uh, the other thing we're going to be looking at is the box called Devil, which it, it's all right. I mean, it's not necessarily realistic, but it's going to give us some findings that we see, I think, that are common uh, when it comes to pen testing. And on top of that, we're going to learn a little bit about generating some of our own malware, which we kind of did last week. If you were here for buffer overflows, we technically generated our own malware. We, we generated shellcode. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that and then we'll see some of the flexibility that you have when it comes to um, when it comes to using Meterpreter in Metasploit. Okay, so our scan is done here. So when we scroll up, we're just looking at the scan and we look at it. If you've watched the last couple weeks, we see that we have RPC open, which is usually a good indicator that we have SMB open. And we can see that actually here when we look at ports 139 and 445, we've got SMB. And we can find out some more information. So we, we're doing some fingerprinting automatically through, uh, through SMB. We can see that it's running Windows 7 Professional Service Pack 1. Um, that dash A does that for us. Remember that that triggers the all scan. So it's doing fingerprinting and trying to gather as much information that it can for us. If we scroll down, we get some more information here. Uh, we get like Harris PC. That's a little bit of information disclosure. Uh, we see that it's on a work group as opposed to a domain. So we've got some information. This is really big. Like knowing the OS type and the service pack it's on is, is always really big. Uh, we can get more information about the security. It, it checks to see if there's authentication used. Uh, it checks to see if signing's enabled. Remember we talked about that last week too when we... We talked about signing and how NTLM relay can be used to um, to get into machines without ever knowing a password. So these are some things just to, like auto check for auto wins. But if I'm a pen tester and I'm seeing this, the very first light bulb that goes off in my head is that we've got SMB open and we've got SMB on Windows 7 Service Pack 1, which just rings all kinds of bells. And this is just from experience that this could be eternal blue. Now, Eternal Blue is an exploit that's been out, like I said, for a couple years, and it came out in the Shadow Brokers release. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, they're, I guess, a, a cyber vigilante group. I don't know what you would call them. Um, and these are leaked NSA tools. So the NSA actually developed this exploit, and then when they leaked this exploit, um, it became part of bigger, uh, bigger exploits out there, right? They packaged it. So one of the most famous packaged exploits that came out of Eternal Blue was WannaCry. 
So if you remember WannaCry, where it was it was getting through through SMB or navigating through SMB, and it was doing ransomware in everyone's system and locking it down. Well, that's this is what its main base was. It was Eternal Blue. So a lot of times when you see uh, Windows 7 or Windows 8, it rings an alarm, especially when you're getting this off of uh, off of SMB. So I always check for that. If you're running like a Nessus scanner, a lot of times they automatically do a scan, but we can use Meterpreter or actually Metasploit to scan for this and see if we think it's vulnerable. Um, another thing that we've done in the past is we've tried to connect to this Windows RPC. We'll also try to connect to uh, 445 and just see if they let us in with um, like anonymous login or default login. So we can definitely check for that, and that would be a finding if it was. But if we're talking low-hanging fruit, easy win, something we want, we're definitely we're throwing on this right here. So I want to go right into Meterpreter. So or Metasploit. I keep calling it Meterpreter. I'm sorry, guys. MSF console to get into Metasploit. And tonight's really going to focus on uh, Metasploit, the things you can do with it post-exploitation, um, and different types of payloads. So hopefully we learn, learn some pretty cool things here. So... With this open, we can just do a search of Eternal Blue, or you can search MS17-010 is the official Microsoft release. So, okay, we've got a few here. So we've got um, this auxiliary admin. We don't want that one. This auxiliary scanner, though. So this is just best practice, right? Even if it shows up, say in a Nessa scan or a vulnerability scan that you run and it says, hey, I think this machine is vulnerable to Eternal Blue. There's a couple things you want to do. The first thing is you're going to want to verify through other means, whether it's like a search like this, that you think it as well is vulnerable to Eternal Blue. And second, you're probably going to want to call the client and say, I'm going to run this exploit that I have it could be damaging to your system, not in the sense that it's going to break the system, but it may take it down. You may get a blue screen, um, denial of service. So if it's a critical system and they don't want you to do that, you might just have to note it and wait or move on. Um, if I'm a pen tester and I see this, I absolutely want to try this because especially if it's on the external, you don't really see this a lot on the external. This is, this is internal. Um, but if say even it's on the internal, this is one of those that's just insta win, you're moving on. Um, this gives you a good foothold depending where you're at in the network. So we're going to go ahead and use this module first. So I'm just going to say use and we're going to paste that. And then we're just going to say options here just to see what we can do. Let me make this a little bigger. So it's asking what we can do here, and it just has some of these defaults set. What we're really looking for, though, is we're looking for the R host that we need to set. That's required. It already has the name pipes for us. It's got the port on 445, um, and it's got the threads account set. If there was a domain user or pass we wanted to provide, we could do that. We don't have to do that here. So all we're going to do is just set the host. So we could say set R host 10.10.10.40, and then we can just say run. Okay, and if you see here, it says the host is likely vulnerable. So at this point, um, I'm calling up the client and I'm saying, hey, look, I think this is vulnerable. I want to run this exploit. Is it okay? We're just going to say the client says, yeah, it's good. Um, let's go ahead and fire that off. So if we want to fire that off, we want to scroll back up. There are, there are a few different um, vulnerabilities here or, or exploits for it. You can see the Eternal Blue one right here. This is the most common one that I use. They've got another one for Windows 8. And they've got this PS Exec, which we kind of used last week, PS Exec. I haven't really used this one. So I'm pretty just custom to using this Eternal Blue. This is the first one that came out. And similar syntax, just copy and paste. We say use. And then again, we could just say options. OK, this looks a little bit better. So we've got the module options. Again, we need an R host, which is required. The R port set for us, and it's 445, which is correct. And then the rest of this is already set for us. So all it needs is the, the host IP address. So again, we're just going to say set R host, and we can pretty much just tab up from our old one, hit enter there. And 
we're going to go ahead and just run this as is. So a few things about uh, Eternal Blue is, so I guess the main thing about Eternal Blue, you could fire this off and it could fail on you. So we just got a session right away. That does not always happen. Um, we're actually getting a communication error, which is interesting. But that does not always happen. Sometimes we'll fire this off and we'll get three fails in a row, which will end the, the exploit, and then you have to fire it again. Um, it is not always an instant win guarantee, even if the exploit's there. So let's see what we've got here in terms of an error. So let me go ahead and just make this full screen for you guys. It looks like we probably lost this session. I'm going to hit control C. I'm going to try running it one more time. If you got lucky on yours and it's working for you, that's awesome. And it could be that this box needs a, needs a reset. How do you know if you should keep trying the exploit? Uh, I would say keep trying it maybe a couple times, two or three times. I wouldn't go overboard with it. Sometimes they appear vulnerable, but they just don't have it. Um, also changing up your payload might, might do it for you as well. So let's go ahead and I'm going to reset this box just because I have a hunch. The last reset was three weeks ago. So let's go ahead and reset that while we wait here. So we're getting the exploit here and we know, at least we know it's vulnerable and it's coming through. Um, but sometimes it's very, very particular. Uh, when I reset a box, it does not reset it for everybody. It resets it for everybody who's in my my area i'm in like a specific vip area so if you happen to be in my vip area then yeah you just got reset but the the chances of that are pretty low um so you they have buckets for everybody so not everybody's attacking the same exact machine if that makes sense so i'm going to go ahead and abort this too um so by default the payload should be generic let's see info if it shows the payload info Uh, it doesn't say it. If we set the payload, it'll it'll say it. I'm just wondering if the payload's the issue, but I don't think it is. I just think the box might be the issue. So if you had luck on this, that's awesome. It might take a minute to reset too. But what I hope to show you are two different ways that we're going to actually get in here. We're going to get in with this, uh, with Metasploit. And typically the Metasploit payload comes generic. And then once, um, once we can confirm it, we can actually try to improve the, the payload that we have and try to get something, uh, an interpreter shell. And I'll show you the difference between those. Is hack the box invite only? Um, it's not invite only. So what it is, is you have to hack the invite code. So it doesn't just give you a membership. You have to hack it, which it's not that difficult. Like, it's made to be simple or simpler just so that people uh, who are new to hacking can still break into, you know, break into it and get into this. It's just like an extra challenge that they added in. So let's go ahead and refresh and see if this machine's up yet. Last reset still says three weeks ago. That's a major fail. Let's try running it one more time, see what happens. Oh, we're unreachable. Okay, we're resetting now. That's good. So the nice thing about this exploit is that it pretty much gives us instant system. Let's see if we get it. So we, we get instant system on it which means we don't have to try to priv ask or anything. We we're pretty much own the system right away. All right, we're getting a response. We should be okay. There we go. So yeah, let's see if this works on the first go this time. We got the shell, we got the win. Did it say win before or did we, we freeze out before we got win? It froze out before we got win. Okay. So this is more custom to what it looks like. 
but it is very unstable. Like if multiple people were running this at the same time on the same box, you might have issues. Okay, so if you got to that screen, just hit enter. Now you see we are at the C Windows System 32. If we were to say, who am I? Okay, we are authority system. That is the equivalent to being root on a Linux machine. Uh, we could do host name, get the host name. So we saw earlier it was Harris-PC. It's the same thing now. So this is one way of doing it. And there's, I mean, there's some flexibility that you have. Like we can go digging around for files. We can, you know, I would go to like the administrator files and see what's there. Um, but the thing is when we have this, this type of shell, this generic shell, we're really limited in what we can do. Uh, we can upload and download things, sure, if we uh, take some interesting ways around it, um, but it's not easy. And we don't have a lot of tools, like we won't have a tool called Kiwi or Incognito, et cetera, that we can use when we have a interpreter shell. Um, so I'm gonna show you how we can use a interpreter shell instead and show you what kind of flexibility that actually has. Um, so let's go ahead and just hit control C. We're going to close out of this shell. So it's hidden right now. When we type in options, oh, actually it popped up now. Okay. So see the payload options. We're running a generic shell reverse TCP. So it's just a reverse shell over TCP. What we're going to do instead is we're going to get a little bit more specific and this doesn't always work. Um, what it, what it does is if your payloads doesn't line up sometimes you might not get the actual shell to exploit sometimes you have to play with the payloads uh, but for this one it will absolutely work and it's absolutely always worth trying to get on with a interpreter shell if you can if you are using metasploit uh, that was not a interpreter shell no it was a generic shell so to use that we can say set payload and we're going to say windows and you can just hit tab and it automatically goes to x64 because this is a 64-bit exploit. And what we're going to do is we're going to say interpreter. We can hit tab on that. And then we're going to give the type that we want. If you want to learn more of the shells, you can hit double tab as you go and see what's out there. We're going to be looking for a reverse TCP. Mine float over a little bit there. And then if you go to options, sometimes it sets it for you, sometimes it doesn't. If we look here, it actually kept my L host and my L port. It's always good to type options afterwards because sometimes it does not keep this information. So we're going to go ahead and just run this again and let's see what the difference is. Okay. So this is what a interpreter shell looks like. You get the nice little thing here that says interpreter. If we wanted to go into an actual command line, we could type shell. And now you can see we're at the C Windows System 32, similar like we were on a Windows command. I'm going to control C and hit Y to get back out. We come back to this interpreter shell here. And then we can just say, um, we could say help. If you want to see all the commands that there are for it, it's really interesting. So we could scroll up and there's a bunch of commands. I'm not going to go over all of them. Um, but you can get a lot of system information. Here's your core commands. Um, you can migrate to a different uh, PID if you're trying to migrate your session. Um, you can find out just a bunch of information, like you have sysinfo or info about it. Uh, we come down here, you've got all your file system commands that you can move around with, CD, LS. Basically, if you think something about a Linux command, then um, it probably has it here. Very, very important. You have a download command. You can download a file and you have an upload command. So it does it for you. You don't have to find some sneaky way to put a file on the machine. Uh, while there are sneaky ways to do it, this is the by far the easiest way. So if you can get up to a interpreter uh, shell like this, so much better. You've got networking commands in here built in. Very nice. Uh, they also do routing and al allows you to like route if you're trying to pivot. Very, very nice. It's got port forwarding. A lot of things in here that are just awesome little features. Um, and then we come down here. It's got some interesting stuff too. Like you can do a key scan. So you start capturing keystrokes, uh, basically a key logger. You could take a picture of the webcam. You can listen to the microphone. 
etc. There's all kinds of dirty things you can do in here. There's privilege escalation. So if we type get system, sometimes that's an easy way to just get instant win. There's hash dumping. So you can dump the hash hashes from the SAM file. And uh, very, very easy stuff a lot of the time. Uh, these are exclusive to Meterpreter shells, not necessarily the exploit. So when we're in here, some things that we like to look at, at least I like to look at, like sysinfo. I like to see what type of payload I'm on. We're on an architecture of uh, x64, and our interpreter session is x64, which is good. If we were on a 32-bit here, or x86, and we were on a system architecture x64, a lot of times our additional payloads, if we try to run something against it, might not work. Some of the tools we load up might not work. Uh, they like to be on the same architecture. That's where that migrate comes into place. Uh, if we say, like, PS, you get all these PIDs in here. And if we were looking at the architecture and it said, okay, well, you're on x86, then we would try to find something we can migrate to. Migrating is difficult a lot of times. You can pick something to migrate to, and it will kill your whole shell that you had going. So you just got to be careful with what you pick. Sometimes it's really easy and really funny. I've migrated to, like, be the antivirus before during an assessment, and that was fun because the antivirus didn't pick up that I was acting as it. Um, so while we're in here, you can also type in load. So load, and then let's see if we just do a double tab. It's got some interesting things. We can load in PowerShell, Python, Mimikatz is awesome, Incognito is one of my favorite, Kiwi is also one of my favorites. So let's talk about one of these here. Let's go to Incognito. So Incognito is token impersonation. And you will hear about this in uh, a lot of penetration testing interviews. So if you have an interview, be prepared to be able to talk about this. Uh, so what we can do is we can say list tokens, and then we can say by user with a dash U or by group with the dash G. There's not going to be a lot here to go on. It's not really that interesting right now, but the theory is what I can teach you. So the theory behind this is let's think as if we were a user on this system or we just got into a system that's in a domain. Now that domain is accessed by other users. Um, that user could be a lower privileged user or it could be a domain administrator. Well, sometimes they have tokens that are left behind on the machine and those tokens will allow us to impersonate them. So as of right now, we can be any of these people. Um, but imagine here that there was a user that was like Bob, and Bob was a domain administrator. We would just say impersonate token, and then we would say the domain, and usually be like whatever the domain is, slash, say Bob. We impersonate Bob, and then we are then domain admin. So pretty cool little trick. We have full control over Bob. Uh, it's a quick, easy, easy win to get domain admin especially if you have um, this, say this exploit or you have access to many machines in the network, you're bound to eventually find a machine that has domain admin tokens on it. Um, so that's where hashing comes into play as well. So if we say something like hash dump and we hit enter here, okay, these are their hashes. We've got the administrator hash and we've got this Harris hash. We can go take these offline. We can try to crack them with Hashcat or whatever your favorite tool is. Another thing that we can do is we could take this hash and put it into a tool like CrackMapExec and just try to pass it around. We don't need to know what the hash is. We just need to know, can we log into machines that have SMB open with this administrator credential? Now, if they're using an image, think about it. Like If it's a massive client and they're using the same image to build out every single machine and they're lazy, right? they don't come in here and they change this administrator password, you may just have access to every single machine in the network at a system level. This is instant win. So these are things to think about. You pass this around, you find your way onto a machine that has, um, you know, or even onto the domain controller if you're lucky, but you get it to a machine that has access to these tokens, and that's one of the easy wins out there. Um, another tool like this, kind of like this, you could say load Kiwi. And if we say help on Kiwi here, just say help, it, it loads the last commands first, just so you're aware. Incognito, then Kiwi down here. 
Uh, the one I like to type in is creds all because it does all of these credentials that are possible out there. So Kerberos, WDigest is another one. Um, you can do, so there's a type of attack called golden ticket. You can do a golden ticket attack with this. There's so much information. Wi-Fi list, uh, the Wi-Fi profiles and creds. So there's so much flexibility when it comes to Meterpreter. And this is really, I mean, it's, people like to talk down on Metasploit a lot of the times, but I feel like Metasploit's one of the most flexible tools that are out there. How do we go about tracking the access intel you have? Um, I do, I use KeepNote. I wish I could show you the KeepNote I have, but I've got client information there right now. But I pretty much will take screenshots or notate things as I go. That way I have it for later. Um, but I pretty much will, I'll set up a, say like a client. I'll start a, a client folder. And then underneath that client folder, I'll say, um, like vulnerabilities found, scans, etc. They'll have each of their own little folders. And then I'll list everything out with screenshots and get as much detail as I can and where I got it from. For OSCP, would this count as the one-time Metasploit use? Yes, it would. Uh, you one, one fire. It doesn't even matter where you're at. As long as you use it, like... So if you, if you run Metasploit, even auxiliary, like the scan, you know that scan that we did when it came to, to Eternal Blue? That counts as your one-time use, but you get it for one box, right? So you can keep going. Uh, everything we've done, say it was an OSCP box, this is all falls under the limits of one time. Now, if we had a second box and we did the same thing, then that's where it becomes invalid. So we could type something in like creds all on this machine, and we're not going to find anything. But if there was information, sometimes you can get clear text passwords, especially with the W Digest. Very, very interesting. Uh, another thing that I look for are, and we'll go into this too when we go into the next machine, but um, our post modules. So there's a bunch of things that you can do in Metasploit that ends up on the post side of things. Um, and I can show you, let's see, we'll just say run post windows. And then I'll just double tab. There's so much stuff. 177 possibilities. Let's look at some of them. We can try capturing key logging, escalation. Uh, there's all kinds of gathers. There's credential gathers. If there's some kind of specific program they're running, like Core FTP, FileZilla, there is just so much stuff that goes on here. More credentials. Um, gather. Look, uh, you can enumerate. Active Directory. Look at all the different enumerate Active Directory commands they have. Uh, enumerate Chrome, computers, devices, domain, domain group users. There's so much stuff in here. So, I mean, I'm just going to hit Q on this and quit. But there's a lot of flexibility. No way on earth that you will ever know all of this or memorize all this. It's just where Google becomes your friend and you say, hey, I want to do something. Does Metasploit have a feature for that? Or your coworker says, hey, why haven't you tried this in Metasploit? What if you're not allowed to use much of Metasploit? How do you perform the exploits? Do they expect you to write your own? Uh, yes, Auto Blue. I don't know. There was also one, if that's the same one I'm thinking about, written by a guy named Sleepy, um, which was really well done as well. So yeah, if you, my, okay, so if you're asking OSCP related, my advice there is that you take, you take an exploit. I have, I am not against, and this is how I operated it, finding the exploit first, getting the hunch, using Metasploit where you can, and then going back and trying to do it the manual way later. I don't think there's any point in trying to do the manual way first because what if you're wrong, right? Like the, the Metasploit way is so quick. Either, either you're right or you're wrong. When it comes to the manual way, your shell code could be a little bit off. Your um, Just like what you type in can be off just a tad, something might not be right. The I've had code where I had to go in and edit the code because the code that I got from exploit DB was wrong. That was a pain in the ass. When Meterpreter works right away or Metasploit works right away, go back and figure it out later. It's good experience on both sides. You're still gonna be okay when it comes exam time. Uh, it doesn't matter which order you do it in. So just, just food for thought.
Uh, videos are geared towards beginners, but I do like to show some intermediate concepts. Uh, I appreciate the nice words. So I, I don't know. I at some point want to have like an intermediate stream, but pretty much where I post and where I gain most traction is from how to hack. And that's usually beginners and sitting around in there. So um, pretty much geared towards beginners now, but doesn't mean I haven't thought about doing intermediate level. Okay, and we are hitting, we're actually past 8.30. Um, I don't mind going on with this information, but we're going to see a little bit more of this when it comes to devil as well. So I want to show you a little bit more flexibility when it comes to when it comes to Meterpreter and show you some of the posts that we're going to do with Meterpreter, and then we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So let's at least get a scan running, and then once we get the scan running, we can come back and talk about some of this stuff. So we said that devil was on... 10.10.10.5. So what we're going to do is we're just going to come in here. And I'll just run the scan from here. So again, nmap dash a dash t4 all ports 10.10.10.5. Now I was smart and went ahead and reset this earlier, um, only because I noticed that there was other malware sitting in the malware location where you plant the malware. Um, so other people had been in there. I just want to make this as clean as possible. I appreciate that, Sneaky Gamer. Uh, this will be on demand, too, if you're interested in watching it. So I appreciate the kind words, man. So back into here. Um, yeah, I mean, there's just so much flexibility with what we can do, what information we can grab. Um, interpreter is one of them, like I said, one of the more flexible programs that there are. Uh, so if I see that there is an exploit, if I, okay, let's say, if I see if there are two exploits, one is a manual exploit and one is a meterpreter exploit and I have to run it on an assessment, I'm going for the meterpreter exploit first. Hands down, no doubt about it. Uh, that is just my preference. This one's going pretty quick. Pop in for a minute. So any questions on what we just covered while we wait for this scan to, to hop in? While I drink my fancy coat? You ran both scans of the same. That's cheating, Jeff. That is cheating. All right. No questions. You snooze, you lose. All right. Let's look at this. We're going to approach this. This isn't... Okay. I will say that I have seen this in an assessment recently. However, it's not common. And I saw it on the internal of a network. So to see this on the external side of things... Um, and I, I'm going to, okay, let me backtrack that too. There were, we had credentials. We had already, we had already hacked credentials. So we had access. It wasn't like FTP was open like it is here with anonymous login. Um, we were able to log in and then upload malware like we're going to do, but we had already completed a step, um, but still holds true. This would be a vulnerability all the way around. How long have I been doing pen testing? I have been at it uh, full time for a year, probably two years when you count just like hobbyist and other things like self-study on my own. Okay, so when we look at this, we've got two things. We've got two ports here. Port 21, FTP, port 80, and that's HTTP. So if I'm looking at this right away, uh, vulnerabilities are popping up in my head, like things that I would write down on an assessment, put in a report, and give to a client. First thing, anonymous FTP login. That's a no-no. You don't want people to be able to see your files unless you have a feature for some reason, and then you probably shouldn't be using FTP anyway. You should be using a secure form of it. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing I see is I see a server header information disclosure. 
Okay, it's not that big of a deal, but it's still information. And if I'm an attacker, I'm looking for things like this, right? I'm saying, okay, well, I know they're running IIS 7.5. If there was an IIS 7.5 exploit sitting out there, this would just be easy win. Especially if you're looking at something like Shodan or, you know, you can use Shodan to say, I want to look for everything on the internet that you can find that has X server header because I know it's vulnerable, right? Another thing here is this trace method. I don't know if I would put this, if I was desperate, this is like fluff material, right? Um, typically I don't put this in unless I'm doing a web assessment and in that web assessment, I have found cross-site scripting because trace by itself really isn't that dangerous. It's when you have cross-site scripting and trace that you can get cross-site tracing. Uh, that's when things become more interesting. So I wouldn't necessarily call this one a, a vulnerability on a report unless I'm really trying to, they're doing a great job and I'm just trying to fluff my report a little bit. How did I get into pen testing? Uh, we could talk about that more in detail, but, but more, uh, more or less self-study certifications and being really, really patient. Uh, but if you want to know more when we do the Q&A in like 20 minutes, I'm happy to talk your ear off. Okay, so the first thing I want to do is I want to either investigate this anonymous FTP, which you could see some of the files are in here. And if you're anything familiar with, or any bit familiar with how IIS works, this IIS start.htm, that looks like a default IIS page, and you've got the welcome PNG, also looks like a default web page to me. So let's go out to port 80 just really quick. And this is at 10.10.10.5. Okay. And this is a default web page. This would be a finding on an assessment. It's a low finding, but it's still a finding. And if you remember, I think we had a box like week one. One of them had a default Apache page. This is the same concept that when you see this as an attacker, you see this and you say, okay, this is a hygiene issue. You might be running this web page for some reason, or you might have the web page open without even noticing that you left it open, right? And your box could be secure, but if you're if you're running a, a site that's just a default web page, it looks bad. It looks like, okay, well, if they're doing this, what other things have they left behind? What other things have they forgot? So if your hygiene looks bad, an attacker may be more curious to look deeper into you. Uh, so this would immediately be a finding here. So we're up to three. Now we know the anonymous FTP login. And if you're following along, I have been told, and it's true, that the newer versions of Kali do not come with FTP installed. So Jeff helped me out earlier and told me the command was apt, actually not even apt get, just apt install FTP if you need it. I'm gonna go ahead and move on. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say FTP into 10.10.10.5. And we set anonymous login, which all that means is we type anonymous for the username, we type anonymous for the password, and we are logged in. Now we can type in help and see what kind of commands we have here. And this is where things get interesting. What, what do we look at? Well, the first thing I want to look for, and the big, big bad one, is this put command. Because that means we could put things. Now, is this vulnerable yes it's not the end of the world um the end of the world would be like if this is more of a vulnerable system through ftp that we could get a shell on immediately right like this is a known vulnerable version of ftp that had some sort of buffer overflow or some kind of command that allowed for a reverse shell or a bind shell that is not the case here the case here is we have not only a put command but we have a way to execute the things we put into it, which is here. If you remember when we looked at the scan, the scan said, okay, it had the is start.htm and the welcome.png. That's what we're looking at right here. We happen to be right now in this web folder. So now what we're doing is we're going to go ahead and try to put some sort of malware in here. Can we look at MMAP? Yeah, that's like an MMAP escape or an MMAP. Um, that's an MMAP, what do you call it, priv-esque. 
So it's not that that one's not here. But um, that is something to look for. So when we talk about put, we're going to put a file here. We got to make this malware though. So I talked about it earlier that we're going to generate some malware. We're going to generate some malware. So let's go ahead and just open up a new tab. We're going to be using MSF Venom again. And the syntax is going to look very similar to last week. So we're going to say MSF Venom dash P for payload. Okay. And what we're going to be doing now is we're going to say Windows. And we're going to be using a interpreter payload. Cannot auto tab this reverse TCP like that. And now what we're going to say is we're going to say L host is equal to our IP address. I believe mine is 10.10.14.36. I honestly don't remember. 14.36. And the L port is the port you want to listen on. I'm just going to say all fives for this one. And then we're going to have to declare a file type. So if you're ever unsure what kind of file you can generate with MSF Venom, there's quick one-liners that are out there. If you were to Google like uh, MSF Venom one-liner, uh, there, there are pages that'll come up that have all the different file types and like a quick grab for you to just copy, paste, and edit out. Um, but one of the ones that you can generate is an ASPX file. So if we're doing ASPX here, which we are with IIS, um, that's what we're going to want to use because if we say we ran like PHP, it's not going to inherently call it like Apache would. Um, so ASP, ASPX, ASM, ASMX are the ones to know, especially if you're doing like dir busting, where you're looking for a directory or files in directories, um, which if I'm doing an assessment and I just find this, I'm going to dir bust this. I'm going to run Nikto on this. Um, but just for the purpose of time and the lesson and things that aren't already there, that is what I would run. Like if I'm doing an assessment, I want to see why is this web server up and what's hidden behind this. Uh, sometimes the web server is up and it's doing something. The machine is serving some complete other purpose. Um, and sometimes the web server is up and they just forgot to uh, hide whatever was sitting here on default port 80. They actually were, they have like directories that are out there and they don't have like a 404 or something when you come to this page. So we're going to go ahead and generate this and we're going to also call it something. Uh, we'll just call it EX and then we'll just say ASPX. We'll let that generate. Should just take a second. Okay. 341 bytes. Now this is where Metasploit is also cool or beneficial. Um, we just generated this. Now, last week when we generated something, we didn't use a interpreter payload. We chose a payload of like Windows uh, x86 reverse TCP or something like that, right? When we did our buffer overflow. This time we're using an interpreter. So last week we did netcat and we set up a netcat listener and used that. Well, what we're going to do this time is we're actually going to set up a listener with an interpreter. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So let's go ahead and make this big. And I'm going to say MSF console. I'm going to disappear for a little bit. Okay. So when we're in here, if we want to set up a listener, what we say is we say use exploit multi handler. If you go to options on this, it really doesn't give you a lot. So you kind of have to know how to work this one just a little bit. Um, so what we're going to do is we need to set a payload. And if you have any guess to what the payload is going to be, it's going to be identical to what you already declared here. Your payload has to be the same. So it's expecting one thing. You've got to provide it that exact same payload. If we say options now, Okay, now it comes in and says, I need your L host, I need your L port. Well, we declared 5555, so I'm going to set that up differently there. And then I'm going to declare my L host, which is my listening host. And that is 10.10.14.36, I believe we said. So we're going to hit enter here. And then I'm just going to say run. Now we can background this and let it run in the background while we do other things in Meterpreter. 
Um, I just usually let it sit here and run when I run these. So now all it's doing is similar to what Netcat would do where Netcat listens for uh, a connection. We're just sitting here listening on this connection for 5555. If something comes through, we're going to try to spawn this meterpreter shell. So now what we need to do is we need to take the payload that we have, which is this ex.aspx, and we need to try to put it in here. So we just say put ex.aspx. Uh, we lost connection. So you say goodbye if you lost it. Let's try it again. Okay, let's try putting it one more time. Okay, data transfer successful. Um, if you run into issues too with a payload, a good thing to note here is that you should set binary. Um, sometimes it's under, I guess, ASCII here. So the, the go-to is usually to set binary, uh, but there's no issue on this one. But if you are ever running with an issue, you're like, oh, I'm sure this exploit's gonna work and it's not working, try setting it to binary um, over FTP. And then we just say ex aspx blanks out here but if we go over we actually have spawned a meterpreter shell so it has talked back to us and now here's where we do the same thing we want to see sysinfo our architecture is x86 our meterpreter is x86 that's good news for us we don't have to do any migration or any anything like that um, another thing I like to do is I like to say, okay, let's get the UID. This is the same thing as who am I? So we are running as IIS app pool web. So we are not system. We are a lower privilege user by default here because that's what IIS runs on. So what are some things we can do? Well, there's a command called get system. We can try to run that. This is like the easy, easy win. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It did not work. So um, we can start digging around and trying to see where we're at. Like, let's look at the present working directory. Okay, we're sitting in C Windows System32 INET Serve. Now I know that typically INET Serve is not a world writable folder. We want something that we can write to because a lot of times when we're gonna try to run a post exploit and we try to do privilege escalation, we need a folder that we're going to be able to write to, to upload um, some sort of malware and then call it back. So we're basically going to be calling another shell out here in a minute. So a good world writable is always a temp folder. So, you know, Linux has temp. Well, Windows does too. So we could say C double dot slash and do Windows slash temp. And this may or may not work. That does not work because you actually need to double it, I believe. There you go. Don't ask me why. I'm sure there's some specific reason. The syntax is always weird when you're sending things through like this. So um, and we can say PWD to confirm we are in temp. OK, now for the cool trick. So this is something that I run. I wouldn't say I run it on assessments, because typically I'm looking for other things. However, it's possible to run it on assessment. It's very possible to run this on a um, capture the flag type event, or it is possible for like a hack the box, et cetera. Thanks, Joseph. It's being escaped. That makes sense. Is there any help command that would show syntax like that? Uh, you have to kind of learn this through it. I don't think the help shows anything in detail. I could be wrong. There could be a help of a specific command, but typically your help is what you see in here. I don't know if it says to do that when you say change directory. It says change directory. Okay, so we're in this directory and there is something we can do from here. There's a command we can say run. Now, a lot of the times when you have, this is what we're in is called a session. We could actually, if we background, we could say background and we could say sessions and you can see all the sessions you have. We've got session one running. Um, if you're doing an assessment and you've got 35 different sessions going on, well, this is how you manage them. So then we go in, we could say sessions one and go back into the session. 
But if we wanted to change out different machines or where we're going, this is how we would manage it. So from here, we can run off of this session in particular, we can run a command, we can run plenty of commands actually, but we could say run post multi recon. And then this is one of my favorite tools in existence is local exploit suggestion. Now it's important that you have the same architecture shell that you do as the system architecture. That's why I checked the sys info. We're on x86 for both. So that makes it perfectly fine to do this. Um, if you were on one or the other, you would need to try to migrate and run this again. And same thing with your privilege escalation exploits. So it takes a minute. It won't take that long. It's going to start looking for possible suggestions that match what goes on with the sysinfo that it pulls back. So it's looking for all these different checks here. And it's saying, OK, well, is this one vulnerable? Is this one vulnerable? And it's looking through 29 of them. So of the 29 that it pulled back, it says, I think out of all these may be vulnerable for this system. So it's a really cool, quick privs tool. This has got me lots of win when it comes to hack the box. You'll see this a lot. So um, especially like on the easier boxes, on the medium and the more difficult, you probably won't see this, but it doesn't mean you won't. OK, for time's sake here, we're going to go ahead and just try to run the one that already we know or I know. So what I would do is I would probably come down this list. This uh, event viewer does not actually work, but we're going to go right to the next one down. I do believe actually that a few of these work. Um, you're more than welcome to try them. But what we can do here is we can try either saying run exploit and type that out. But sometimes it doesn't work. So what I actually like to do is I like to just background it. And then I'll just say use instead. And then if we say options in here, OK, so it wants a session. So we're going to set the session to 1. And options again will show us that it's set to 1. Now, the one thing that it doesn't do here is it's not showing us, again, the payload information and where it's defaulting the port to and where it's defaulting the IP address to. So we're going to go ahead and do that manually because a lot of times what it likes to do is it likes to try to set the L host and the L port to your to a standard 4444 on the L port. And then it tries to do it to your actual machine and not your VPN IP address. Um, so we got to make sure since we're on a VPN for hack the box that we're pointing it to the right IP address. So we're just going to go ahead and set the L port. I'm going to call this one all sevens. And if we go options again, let's see where it was pointing. Uh, it still doesn't show us. Okay, so we'll set the L host as well to 10.10.14.36. Let's see if it shows us now. It's not showing us. That's okay. So it's always good to do this, though, because I have a feeling that if we would have ran it otherwise, it would have defaulted on 4444, and it would have defaulted on our, our standard IP. Not always true, though. OK, so we've got that. We've got the session set. All we need to do is type in run. And this is going to go ahead and try to privesk in that session. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. OK, didn't work. Sometimes it breaks the machine, too. These privests are tricky. Let's see if we get anything back now. We don't. And we've actually, oh, see, look. Look at the, the port here, the 192.168.56.128. That's not what we told it to go, right? Even though we set the L host, it took the L port, but it didn't take the L host. And this is what I was referring to. This is why you're not going to get a session, because it's trying to exploit something back, and it won't work. Yeah, super sneaky. So let's go ahead and set the L host now that it ran. And we're going to try to run it again. I have a feeling we broke it. I have a feeling we broke it. Uh, let's set the L port. Let's just do all eights and try to run it. That's OK. We're broken. So if we go into sessions one, uh, if we try to type in shell, yeah, we don't even have this session. And that's OK. So let's type exit here to exit out of that, close it. And all we're going to do is the same thing we did before. We're going to make sure that it works this time. So we're going to say 
uh, use exploit multi handler. The options should still be set to all five, so that's fine. We already told this all fives. All we should have to go back and do is run this exploit again, in theory, if it works. If I would type in run. There we go, we've got a session again. Okay. And then we can background this. And these are really finicky sometimes. And then what were we using? Go up to use options. We are on session two now. I believe usually increments. Yep, session two. And we've got everything else proper. Let's try running it again. There we go. Sneaky, sneaky wouldn't let us change our L host. And that's, that's a good reason into why you should be able to change your L host or why you're looking for that because it tried to run to a different IP address. So we are authority system. Similar to before, I would be running hash dump, dumping those hashes. We've got the administrator, we've got this Babis user. Who knows where that gets us into? Um, another one that I like to run that I haven't shown you guys is if we're on a domain, we did the GPP last week or the C passwords. There is a tool for that. I can never remember it, so let me go ahead and just pull up what that is. Uh, if we Google it, say GPP Metasploit. Okay, so we can background this session. And it's not going to find anything, so I won't show it to you. But you could say use post Windows gather credentials GPP. Say options. And what this does, if you were here last week, remember we had that groups.xml folder that we found or that file that we found in the sysfall. So what we're going to do is we would run this against that session and it's going to go ahead and search for that automatically. So I can show you what it looks like. Set session uh, two and then we would say, actually, I think we're on three. Set session three and then you'd run it. And it'll look for any type of sysfall or anything like that. Um, but it's not finding it because this is not actually a domain controller. Um, I don't know about the SID, to be honest. We're being honest with each other, White Rose. This is not running Windows Server. I believe, right? This is just a Windows 7 build 7600. Thanks for the sub, Dr. Tuna. I appreciate that. So there's no sign here that points that this is a domain controller. It's not on server. Nothing says like it's on a domain. Uh, actually, it does have a domain of HTTP, but it's not the domain controller. All right, nine o'clock, right on time. So let's go ahead and do some Q&A if you guys want. I'm open, open book. If you have questions on what we just covered, please let me know. If not, whatever you want to ask. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. Uh, Deedle. So if you can't get your OVPN connection to work, what syntax are you using? Are you just using open VPN space, your VPN name dot OVPN? I would try, you should be able to migrate your, um, your VPN to a different group. We're not focused on the flags. I, I should throw out there. The the flags are there. They're in the on the desktop for the user and the administrator. They're there. We could go get them. This is more of like a pen testing focus than it is a capture the flag focus. Um, sorry, let me backtrack here. So, Deedle, I would I would try. You could change the 
the region or group you're in, I would try to change that or regenerate your OVPN. I know you said you can't get it to work. Um, if not, I would reach out to support and see what they can do for you. You, they might, you might have a common problem or something that they'd be able to fix. Where did I get this shirt? I got this shirt from my wife. I borrowed it. I thought it looked cool. She likes large hoodies, and I barely fit into this thing, so it works. What is something you wish you knew when you were starting in cybersecurity? Um, I think I would wish I knew how, I guess, competitive or difficult it was to get a job. I kind of figured, like, you know, I get a certification or a specific certification that would pretty much be okay, everybody wants me kind of thing, and that just was not the case. So it was more like you got the OSCP, pat on the back, here you go. I didn't find a job for six months after I got the OSCP. Um, so it's very, I feel like a lot of certifications are just pat on the back. Even now with experience, it feels like... Um, I couldn't just go pick any job that's that's out there. Like the the cyber field for for what it is is really it's really hard to, even when you're in it to migrate or move or um, it's in demand, but they're very selective about who they take. If that makes sense, but it's good to be selective on your end too. I'm sure I could like if I wanted to go get a job, I could get a job, but like you got to find the job also that's right for you. Um, so you should be selective in that choice. My writing exploits myself instead of using MSF Venom. Um, I have never used a written exploit for anything outside of like Hack the Box or the OSCP Labs. Like if we're talking for an assessment, very, very, very rarely you might see some modification that you have to do to an exploit that like the exploit requires modification. It's like some one-off uh, exploit that you haven't seen. You know, or there's sometimes where the exploit will say, here's the shell code, because maybe it's a buffer overflow. And you have to take the shell code and replace it with your shell code so that it actually talks back to you. I've seen that before, but I'm not like writing any of my own exploits. Uh, a lot of times, especially like on the common ones, if there's, if there's an opportunity to write an exploit, somebody's already written the exploit. So you're looking for specific ports, like um, you're looking for, say, LDAP, you're looking for Kerberos, which is like 88. Uh, DNS running, like 53 running, would be a good indicator that you might be on a domain controller. SMB being open would be a good indicator. Um, obviously, SMB is going to be on a lot of machines in a, in a domain. But you're looking for LDAP, Kerberos, um, some sort of like active director. Usually in a scan, it, when it pulls up, um, it'll say you know, it'll give you a really good indicator. If not, if you're trying to find it, not all the time that when you're doing it, but you can query, um, send queries out and, and try to look for the domain controller. Um, there's specific like PowerShell queries if you have access to PowerShell. Um, there's some things that you can run if you're on the domain, and that's where it gets tricky too. So you have to either be like if you're an administrator user, sometimes you can't. Uh, by administrator, I mean like system. If you're a system on a domain, that doesn't mean you're on the domain, if that makes sense. You have to migrate into a user. Um, so just because we pop something like uh, Eternal Blue, we would actually just still not have domain access if we were sitting on a domain. We'd be sitting there with system. doesn't mean we wouldn't be able to capture, um, capture or migrate our way into it. We're just still not domain at the time. So, But there's, there's generally pretty good indicators when you scan against the domain that it's a domain controller. A lot of companies, especially if they're small too, their domain controller is usually their file server. So if they've got map drives, it's typically going to their to their domain controller. The bigger companies might have multiple domain controllers.
Where do you get your CTFs from? Uh, so if you want like CTF practice, ctftime.org, I'm typing it in, I think is really good. Those are like live and you're competing against other people, but you could just do it for fun. You don't have to do it for the competition. Um, but at the same time, Hack the Box is cheap, free if you want it. It's kind of slow on the free side, but it's 10 bucks a month if you can afford that. Uh, so that's pretty pretty good option. Uh, they're a lot more newer in terms of... So they're not as realistic. I like to show as many realistic things as I can, but you see a lot of good exploits that are common or that are, that are realistic on a one-off. You see a lot of OWASP top 10, things like that. Um, so I think my, my first time doing uh, XXE exploit was on Hack the Box. So you get exposed to a lot of things like deserialization, things that you don't see a lot of the time in the wild that you get to see in Hack the Box firsthand. You get to play with it and read write-ups about it. So it's kind of cool. How do you get out of help desk and transition into a network admin job? Um how I did it, I just got a bunch of certifications and then applied around and kind of got lucky. But I mean, it's just, it's being patient, having the right certifications or being able to say, I don't know, I'll learn and give me a job, please. I will do whatever it takes when I get the job. So like I, the, when I got my network job, the only reason, or one of the only reasons I got it was because I had a clearance. So that was the luck factor. But the other factor was when I said at the end of the interview, I told them, I was like, I don't know Cisco or anything about it, uh, I, but I promise you that if you give me the opportunity, I'll, I'll come in here and I'll learn it. And I had my CCNA within a month. Um, so you just got to like be willing to, to work for what you want and tell them that you're willing to work. A lot of employers like that empty slate. That's something that they can build upon, if that makes sense. Some people want the experience. Me, I want the person who's motivated, who has that, that slate that I can like kind of mold into the person or the, you know, how I want them to be the employee I want them to be. Um, I will take that a million times over somebody who knows everything and come in thinking they know everything and there's nothing to learn. That makes sense. I do. If you haven't read it, I do have a blog article on how I transitioned from help desk to network admin to, um, pen testing, which I can pull up for you. So you can only use Metasploit one time, White Rose. They are using, I'm guessing, some sort of uh, packet information. They're they're tracking your packet on the network, would be my guess. They're able to detect if Metasploit's been used more than one time against an address. Hey, thanks, String Central. I appreciate that. Hope you learned something. What's my favorite movie? Oh man, I don't know if I have a favorite. Is this one of those? Um, is this one of those personal questions? Because you have two out of the three of my account information, Jeff. I feel like you watch enough streams that you're ready to to hack me finally. So my favorite movie is probably Shawshank Redemption. If I have a top five or a top three, I like. I don't know if rom-com would be okay when harry met sally was good if i have a favorite rom-com it's when harry met sally um the perks of being a wallflower is a really really good movie if you haven't seen it those are definitely three of my top five i'd have to think about rounding it out i'd probably put the shawshank redemption at number one though My first cert was the A+. Plus. I did the A+, plus, Network+, plus, Security+, plus, Linux+, plus. like the good comp Tia boy that I was. Uh, any resources I'd recommend to learn to start pen testing? Uh, I would learn Linux and learn Python first and then dive into like a beginner certification course. I would stay away from the CEH. Like the e-learn security, the junior penetration testing, that's 400 bucks or so. I think it's a pretty good, at least a pretty good starter. 
Uh, Hack the Box is good. Vuln Hub's good. Those are free. Just Google Google things like Google how to scan. You just need to know the... You could buy a $10 Udemy course. It might not be good, but at least if you understand the methodology, like the five steps of hacking, then you can get better. Okay, what do I need to, to accomplish this? How do I get information out of this box? And then you just kind of start from there. And it all, it all grows as you grow over time. Uh, cool Hand Luke or Dear I've never seen either of those. Please don't hate me for, for not seeing those. Is the stereotype true that red, team, red teamers tend to be cocky? Uh, I don't know if they tend to be cocky. I feel it's weird, right? Like, so pen testers, I feel like are a different breed. Like you think IT a lot of times and you think like antisocial, nerdy type, especially when you get into to development and things like that. But I feel like you see all different types of personalities. I, w I would say there's definitely cocky people out there, but um, I, I, everybody I work with is incredibly humble, uh, especially like we're all afraid to say, I have no idea. Hey, do you know how to do this? Can you help me? And I think that's the best kind of team to work on. Do I feel like the A plus is necessary? Depends. Um, have you worked in IT before? Are you looking for your help desk job to get into the industry? Then the A plus will help you. I was working in help desk when I got the A plus and I felt like the A plus taught me some tricks that I didn't know. So it was one of the more useful certifications I got at the time for what it's worth. You ran it again and it connected you to a different host. I have no idea. Is this in the hack the box network or is this on something else? If you're asking me, no, the EJPT is not the cert from CompTIA. It's from eLearn Security. The cert from CompTIA that just came out is the Pen Test Plus. I have that actually because I took it in beta. It's not that bad of a certification. I just think that the, the hands on certifications are better. Um, so I would definitely lean towards e-learn security, but I would say the pen test plus is light years ahead of the CEH. I think the CEH is terrible. You currently have a help desk job. You're in school for cybersecurity, getting into pen testing. Um, I mean, I would only say to get, if you don't have any certs, I don't know if the A plus would even be worth it. It's just like, if you feel like you're lacking in knowledge and the A plus studying could could fill in those gaps and make you better at your job and get you a promotion. Maybe that would help. Um, but I would probably start looking into learning networking if you're comfortable with your help desk job. Like if you are the, the guy that says I can answer every ticket that's out there, then um, maybe start looking into to learning other things. Uh, so white rose, it took me 45 days from start to finish and I put in about 200 hours. So, I mean, it's just, it's just long nights and it depends on your, it depends on your aptitude, I guess. Like some people just pick it up faster, right? Like if some people just get it, it doesn't mean that, uh, it's easy, easier by any means, but like some people it's just like anything. Some people get math better than others. It doesn't mean that two people, one person getting it better, can't do the same thing the other person can. It might take more time. Uh, but I, my advice is to purchase the 90 days, do about 30 to 35 machines in the labs, and then try the exam. That way, my thought process was it would be better to fail the exam and have lab time left than have to purchase lab time again um, and a, still a second attempt. Like the second attempt, 60 bucks. The extra lab time, I think, is a couple hundred. Um, so I took it at day 45, which was the halfway point, uh, just to see where I was at, to see if I could knock it out. And I ended up knocking it out. So it, you just kind of got to feel it out. So you don't know you're ready until you take the exam and either it kicks your ass, you get close and almost pass it, or you just pass it. Um, so that's my recommendation.
Hey, Tommy K. Thank you, man. Absolutely Mavs fans for life. We got the, the Luca burger, the young burger, man. We're going to be good next year, I hope. I hope we can bring some more talent. One more big name would be nice. Do you think there's a certain CompTIA? I would avoid CompTIA unless there's a specific employer you're interested in that requires it. Uh, the OSCP is the one that is the HR filter right now. I I stand by saying that the better training comes from eLearn Security, but you're not going to bypass HR with it. So it's kind of a uh, catch-22. You should plug VetSec. I always plug VetSec. I plug VetSec every stream. I'll plug them right now since you're saying it. If you are a veteran, military veteran, we have a website, VetSec veteransec.com we have a slack channel there's about 450 people in there right now um, all military veterans doesn't matter what country you're from doesn't matter how long you served any of that uh, if you're interested in cybersecurity at any kind of level and you want to network with other people that work in the field or are at the same level as you uh, it's a great great community great bunch of guys everybody looks out for each other so definitely check it out uh, if you need a link to, if you, it's veteransec.com slash slack. You can also click on the website button I have down below and I have VetSec on that site as well. Uh, did I just get it? Um, I picked up pen testing really fast, but I would not say by any means that I am an expert, will ever be an expert or will be ever uh, above average. I don't know. Like, I feel like, and that could be imposter syndrome, but I feel like there's always somebody that's way better, right? I just like, I like to teach one because I like to get back and two, because it helps me remember a lot of this stuff. Uh, but I feel like just constant repetition helps you get it. Uh, I don't know if I have the, the knack or if it just came easy or what it is, but I, I got the concepts down. I understand the process that came easy, but the uh, a lot of this stuff is still way over my head. It gets really complicated on the on the higher advanced levels. I'm not sure, Red Havoc, why that would do that. I've never heard of it migrating over. I wish there was somebody more... I guess more expertise than than me here to to maybe help answer that. I would have to kind of see what it was doing. But it shouldn't if you're if you're running Metasploit, it shouldn't have um jump ship like that. If you're in government, yeah, CYSA is okay. I I guess yeah, for 8570, is that IAT 2 or 3? For CYSA. I haven't been keeping up with, with 8570. It's two. Hey, thanks for the host, Kazzy. I appreciate that. Any tips for getting an internship as a high schooler? If you've got certifications already as a high schooler, I think you're going to be way ahead of the game, man. Way ahead any kind of drive or desire and you just show um, you show a passion, people are going to pick you up, especially in high school, high school. A lot of the kids nowadays too, they've got all these um, like the cyber Patriot and everything else. That's if you have a cyber Patriot team in your high school, I would look into joining that. If not look into um, finding one around you and joining one. But in terms of getting an internship, just get a good resume together. I mean, it doesn't have to be great because you're in high school, but um, try to network if you can. If your parents will allow you to go to, if you have like a, they're called DEF CON, but like DC, whatever your area code or your is, right? Like say if you lived in 600 area code, it would be DC 600. Um, so look at DC, whatever, you know, and try to try to go there. Um, yeah, the kids in Cyber Patriot are really smart, super smart. And it's a good way to like learn from other people too. If you're going to Carolina Con next month, come say hi to me. I will be talking at Carolina Con, so please come say hi.
I'll have to shoot you a follow, Kazzy. I'd love to check out your stuff. I don't know much about software engineering. If you're in the Charlotte area, there are a million Cyber Patriot places. But you said you signed up for it, so that's good. You should have no issues, especially if you're in Charlotte. Charlotte is booming for cyber, especially in the banking industry. Uh, I have not been to Carolina Con before because Carolina Con was in Raleigh last year. Um, this is my first year in the Carolinas, so I wasn't here for that last year, but this is the first time it's in Charlotte. Do I, I don't know what time it ends at night. I'm there's, I think they're doing it for multiple days, and typically there's an after party, which involves drinking and alcohol, so I don't know um, if that's something you'd want to go to anyway. It would probably end around 5 or 6, would be my guess. I haven't seen a schedule. They haven't released speaker schedule or event schedule or anything yet. Uh, yeah, the pros outweigh it. I mean, so the issue that you're going to run into is, yeah, they don't replace full computers and most of the time they're meant to be a challenge. Um, this is for Deedle. I mean, so like they're meant to be a challenge and capture the flag in terms of they're not going to be realistic. I feel like you learn a lot of the realism on the job, if that makes sense, but just having the practice and understanding the methodology is good. I don't think it hurts. I mean, hack the box is, is awesome. Phone hubs are awesome. It definitely doesn't hurt to, to learn some of the, the methodology. Yeah, you can have good or bad experiences on Cyber Patriot, I feel like. That's with anything in life. Um, I tried to mentor a team in Charlotte, and it is difficult. Like, I found one to pick me up, and then they, they called me one time. So maybe I'm just... <laughs> I was useless, I guess. I don't know. Carolina Con hasn't officially released a schedule. They're saying it's supposed to start. If it starts Friday at 8, that's probably some sort of kickoff. Um, I doubt. I, I have no idea what they're planning. I doubt that's like a keynote or anything. Usually the, the cons kick off in the morning. That sounds like maybe like a little pre-party. If they're doing talks at Friday at 8 o'clock at night, I would be surprised. But I've never been, so I don't know how they operate. Nice. Yeah, I feel like it's tricky for the the people who are running the team if they don't come from like a computer background how to really navigate getting a mentor. Like I was completely useless to my team. I served no purpose. I helped them find one problem with packet tracer and that was it. Yes, I know, Jeff. You're always bragging about them and how awesome your experience with Cyber Patriot is. I got a cool t-shirt, I guess.
If you can get with in with the 49th, that's good. Um, I don't know if you can get into the... That's the college program, right? I mean, if you can go up to UNCC and, and chat there, I know they've got a cyber division that's it's getting pretty big. That's definitely a good way to network. There's a group in Charlotte, too. They're, they're okay. Um, I forget what they're, they're called, but they're on Meetup. I went to one Meetup. I really didn't care for it that much, if I'm being honest. Uh, podcasts. I like Darknet Diaries if we're talking on topic. And then I think the, I mentioned this too, the Sands podcast is all right. I feel like you're trying to catch up on, on news of the day or news of like the week. They have like a little short podcast. That's good. I use that like when I'm walking or whatever. Um, uh, I don't listen to a ton of podcasts, but Darknet Diaries is, is on point. That guy's going places. Joe Rogan. I did watch the Joe Rogan one. The one with uh, Elon. He's turned into a, a pretty good podcaster. Like a good interviewer. I feel like Howard Stern is probably one of the best interviewers of all time. I don't know if that counts as a podcast. It should count as a podcast, even though he's on the radio. Kind of the same lines. Questions, questions, any questions? Might be ending the stream early this week. I'm going to try to do something different next week. We'll see if I can get it all put together. I've got plans, ambitions, goals. We'll see. Bye, Jeff. I'm probably right behind you, buddy. Thanks for joining me. I appreciate it. Uh, I've already got picked up for a talk at Carolina Con. Cynics. Is it Cynics? 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 I don't know my time slot or anything, but. I think they're doing a rolling call for papers right now. It's 1.30 a.m. Where do you live? Is, are you in England? Across the pond, White Rose. Thank you for joining me so late. You must be on like the far, uh, far west side of the UK because I've never met anybody that. Oh no, we just changed time. Never mind. I don't know if you guys do that. I probably not. It's probably a silly question. We just moved up an hour, so usually you guys are five hours ahead. But we're gaining on you now. It's four hours. How do you start in help desk? Uh, yeah, show interest in computers. Having the A plus cert helps. But just being honest in an interview, showing a desire to want to fix things. And when they ask you, what do you do if you don't know how to fix a problem? You just be honest and say, I'll Google it. I'll look it up. 
because that's what 90% of help desk is anyway. You're looking things up. We didn't know how to fix most of those problems. Google does, though. Honestly, if you can just say, did you turn it off and turn it back on? That's half the work. It really is. Help desk is mainly reboots. Um, help, I forgot my password, or help, I locked myself out. Not saying that real stuff and fun stuff doesn't come up, because it does, but I'm just telling you the majority of it is pretty much that, especially with your bigger clients who hardly use their email, and then they go to log into their email and can't remember and then deny service themselves. Hey, Jake, thanks for chilling out with me, man. Appreciate it. My printer isn't printing. I like the printer ones. Because the printer ones, you go in there and you clear the spool out of the Windows folder, spool or whatever, and then you look like a ninja and you feel like a ninja. That was one of my favorite ones. Yeah, because the A-plus covers, like, dot matrix and random printers you're not going to see anywhere besides maybe a car dealership, I feel like, depending on when you, you take the A-plus. I don't know what the new stuff has. I took it a while ago. But yeah, I don't know how Carolina Con's going to be this year. I heard it was good last year. But it's a new location. The 49th's running it, so it's going to be interesting. You can come watch my talk and tell me how terrible it was after. Just throw tomatoes. Bring tomatoes and then throw them, please. Uh, now, the adults love love the kids. There will be really good opportunities for you at a con to like learn and, and just soak it all in. There's a CTF that's going on. I think it might be like a wireless CTF. So definitely try to just bring your laptop, have fun, get some cool swag if they've got it, like stickers and whatever else they've got, uh, and just come listen to the talks and try to meet people. That's a good way to, to try to find a job or an internship, too. There may be employers there. Thanks, White Rose. It's nice uh, chatting with you tonight. Appreciate you always being here. <laughs> 